Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm Lisa Olson with the Newberry Library. Thank you for joining us for tonight's program, Chicago Poetry Then and Now. We have viewers tuned in through multiple platforms in Chicago and far beyond. Welcome, everyone. The Newberry is an independent research library in Chicago with collections spanning more than six centuries of human history in Europe and the Americas. We have been free and open to the public since 1887. Recently, we reopened our doors to readers and viewers. You can visit our website to make a reader appointment or you can drop by the library without an appointment to see our two fall exhibitions on view now. The first exhibition is called Renaissance Invention and our second is called Decision 1920, A Return to Normalcy. Our bookshop is also now open the same hours as the exhibition galleries. Our public po programs will remain online for the foreseeable future. We continue to offer research and learning opportunities through a range of digital resources, online classes, and virtual public programs like this one. I invite you to visit our website to check out all that we have available for you. You're also welcome to follow us on social media for more opportunities to engage with our collections, our staff, and stories that bridge the past and the present. During tonight's program, please enter questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the comments section if you are joining us on Facebook or YouTube. As, as time permits, our poets will respond to your questions. We're grateful to the Paul M. Angel Family Foundation for providing fun, funding for tonight's event. Now, it's my real pleasure to introduce tonight's poets. And this is when those poets can click on their videos because they're the ones you're here to see see uh, so that we can all see you. If you'll click on those videos now, your video screens, that would be great. Here we go. All right. Now I won't offer long and elaborate introductions, which you can find um, in the Q&A if you check on the links that give you the full biographies of our three poets. I'm going to keep it very brief. Srikanth Reddy, who his friends call Chiku, is the author of three books of poetry, the latest of which is called Underworld Lit. Here it is right here in hard copy from Wave Books. Chiku's previous book, Voyager, was named one of the best books of poetry in 2011 by The New Yorker, The Believer, and NPR. His first collection, Facts for Visitors, received the 20, 2005 Asian American Literary Award for Poetry. Chiku is currently professor of English and creative writing at the University of Chicago. Suzanne Buffum is the author of three collections of poetry, most recently A Pillow Book, which was named one of the 10 best poetry books of 2016 by the New York Times. The cover is really beautiful, it looks like this. Her other books are The Irrationalist, which was a finalist for the 2011 Griffin Poetry Prize, and Past Imperfect, which won Canada's Gerald Lampert Award. Suzanne was born and raised in Canada and she has lived in Chicago for roughly 15 years with jaunts back up to Canada and elsewhere. She too teaches poetry at the University of Chicago. Now Ed Roberson is the author of many, many, many collections of poetry and he's received numerous prizes for his extraordinary body of work. Born and raised in Pittsburgh, Ed has lived in Chicago for over a decade where he is artist in residence at Northwestern Universities, at Northwestern University. I always look forward to reading Ed's new work, and I know he has a book that is about to be released, but I specifically requested that he read from a series published in 2019 called Architectonus. These are really stunning poems inspired by buildings in Chicago. Now our program tonight is going to be structured in two parts. First, we'll have each of our poets read a poem from Chicago's past a poem written during Chicago's so-called Renaissance period. Uh, we'll spend a few minutes discussing each of these poems amongst us, um, the four of us. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll have each of our poets read work of their own. And if we have time, we will certainly take your comments and questions. So without further ado, I think I will hand it over to our three poets, starting with Chiku. Hey, thanks, Liesl, for inviting us uh, here. And thanks to the Newberry Library and um, to the Angel Family Foundation for um, 
allowing me to display my ignorance of Chicago's literary history uh, tonight. I was really um, excited to learn more about um, Chicago poetry then because I'm so kind of immersed in Chicago poetry now. And, um, and in kind of clicking around and, and looking around, I found um, a poet who I'd never known before uh, named Frank Marshall Davis, a really extraordinary writer who, um, uh, maybe I'll just say a few words about before I read him because he's not very well known. Um, he was born in uh, Arkansas City, Kansas uh, toward the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, I always thought that Arkansas City, Kansas was a very confusing name for a city. Uh, but he was exposed to racism very early on in a traumatic way because um, when he was basically almost killed by a group of uh, white five-year-olds who had heard about lynching and were kind of play acting at it. And, um, and, um, and he never forgot that experience. Um, as he, and he brought that with him when he moved to Chicago, began working as a journalist on black newspapers, became very politically active um, in, um, in the communist uh, parties. I, I don't know if he was ever actually a member of the communist party, but he was very politically radical. Uh, got involved with the South Side Writers Group um, and became identified with the Chicago Renaissance. Um, then moved on to um, Hawaii, kind of by accident. I think he went on, on vacation and found the racial climate there to be so um, different uh, in, in lots of good ways that he decided to stay. And as a kind of little footnote to his this little mini biography I'm, I'm reviewing now, um, met a young Barack Obama. Uh, who, as he was um, kind of an elder statesman in the literati, uh, avant-garde literati community in Hawaii and made a huge impression on Barack, on the young Barack Obama. Um, he's mentioned several times in Obama's uh, memoirs. Uh, so even though he left Chicago, he kind of, um, his voice and his thinking came back to Chicago uh, in, in, in ways that we can all relate to. So the poem is called Self-Portrait. I would be a painter with words, creating sharp portraits on the wide canvas of your mind. Images of those things shaped through my eyes that interest me. But being a 10th American in this democracy, I sometimes sketch a miniature, though I contract for a mural. Of course, you understand this democracy. One man as good as another, from log cabin to White House, poor boy to corporation president, Hoover and Browder with one vote each, a free country, complete equality, yeah. And the rich get tax refunds, the poor get relief checks. As for myself, I pay five cents for a daily synopsis of current history, two bits and the late lowdown on Hollywood twist a dial for Stardust or Shostakovich. And with each bleacher stub, I reserve the right to shout, kill the bum at the empire. Wherefore am I different from nine other Americans? But listen, you don't worry about me. I rate. I'm convert 4711 at Beulah Baptist Church. I'm social security number 337 16 34 58 in Washington. Thank you, Mr. God and Mr. Roosevelt. And another thing, no matter what happens, I too can always call in a policeman. So thanks for, uh, for projecting the poem itself. It's extraordinary and, and I won't say much about it now. I think we'll have a conversation about these poets, but I will say the one thing that um, drew me to it was this incredible moment when the poet shares his social security number <laughs> with, uh, with the reading public. And, you know, I think when we think about the lyric, lyric poetry and, and privacy and identity, that felt like a really revolutionary gesture 
uh, for a writer who was under FBI surveillance and under investigation by the House uh, Senate uh, on American Affairs Committee and all kinds of government organs for his political beliefs to like open himself up, up so um, so radically at that moment. Um, but I'll uh, look forward to talking more about him and, and hearing more poetry. Thanks, Chiku. So do you want to do you want to move and have Suzanne read a poem of her choosing and then Ed read his and then we'll kind of gather back and discuss all three. Yeah. Okay. Suzanne. Sure. Okay. Well, I would say, you know, as a white woman who grew up in Canada um, and didn't move to Chicago until my early 30s, in many ways, I'm the last person who should be talking about Chicago Renaissance. Um, but on the other hand, I've lived in Chicago for about 15 years. And I'm actually particularly excited to be reading with Ed tonight. Um, my first job in Chicago was at Columbia College downtown. And I don't know if Ed remembers this, but we actually shared an office a little we, with someone else as well, I think. But um, it was always a real delight to cross paths with Ed in the halls there. Um, and I would say also that a lot of what I've learned about the racial and social history of my home in Chicago for the past 15 years has come by way of reading the work of its poets, particularly the work of Gwen Gwendolyn Brooks, whose home in Bronzeville uh, was only a few miles away from where I live now in Hyde Park. The poem I'm gonna read today is a little bit long. It's called The Lovers of the Poor and it's from her 1960 collection, The Bean Eaters. Before I read it, I'll just say that I think for me, what's interesting and unsettling to me about this poem as a white reader is that where most of Brooks' poems take us inside the lives and homes of Chicago's black citizens, this poem reverses that gaze and takes a hard look at a group of white women from the Ladies of the Betterment League, whose charitable work and largesse takes them down to the South Side where they see a lot more than what they want to see uh, of the lives of the poor. And I think at a time when there's so much talk about how to be a good white ally, this poem about white women who fail to see their own lives in proper relation to racial justice feels particularly uh, relevant and current. Um, so I will just read it. As I say, it's a little bit long. The lovers of the poor arrive. The ladies from the Betterment League arrive in the afternoon, the late light slanting in diluted gold bars across the boulevard, brag of proud seamed faces with mercy and murder hinting here, there, interrupting all deep in debonair, the pink paint on the innocence of fear. Walk in a gingerly manner up the hall cutting with knives served by their softest care, served by their love so barbarously fair. Whose mothers taught, you'd better not be cruel. You'd better not throw stones upon the wrens. Herein they kiss and coddle and assault anew and dearly in the innocence with which they baffle nature. Who are full, sleek, tender clad, fit, 50-ish, aglow, all sweetly abortive, hinting at fat fruit. Judge at high time that 50-ish fingers felt beneath the lovelier planes of enterprise. To resurrect, to moisten with milky chill, to be a random hitching post or plush, to be for wet eyes, random and handy hem. Their guild is giving money to the poor, the worthy poor, the very, very worthy and beautiful poor, perhaps just not too swarthy, perhaps just not too dirty, nor too dim, nor passionate. In truth, what they could wish is something less than derelict or dull, not staunch enough to stab though, gaze for gaze, God shield them sharply from the beggar bold, the noxious needy ones whose battles bald, nonetheless for being voiceless hits one down. But it's all so bad and entirely too much for them. The stench, the urine, cabbage and dead beans, dead porridges of assorted dusty grains, 
the old smoke, heavy diapers, and they're told something called chitterlings. The darkness, drawn darkness or dirty light, the soil that stirs, the soil that looks the soil of centuries, and for that matter, the general oldness, old wood, old marble, old tile, old, 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 not home kind oldness, not Lake Forest Glencoe. Nothing is sturdy, nothing is majestic. There's no quiet drama, no rubbed glaze, no unkillable infirmity of such a tasteful turn as lately they have left, Glencoe Lake Forest, and to which their cars must presently restore them when they're done with dullards and distortions of this fistic patience of the poor and put upon. They've never seen such a make do as newspaper rugs before. In this, this flat, their hostess is gathering up the oozed, the rich rugs of the morning, tattered, the beast battered, readies to spread clean rugs for afternoon. Here's a scene for you. The ladies look in horror behind a substantial citizeness whose trains clank out across her swollen heart, who arms akimbo almost fills a door. All tumbling children, quilts dragged to the floor and tortured thereover, potato peelings, soft-eyed kitten hunched up, haggard to be hurt. Their league is allotting largesse to the lost, but to put their clean, their pretty money, to put their money collected from delicate rose fingers tipped with their hundred flawed rose nails seems they own spode, low stuffed candelabra, mantles and hostess gowns and sunburst clocks, turtle soup, Chippendale, red satin hangings, obusons and Hattie Carnegie. They winter in Palm Beach, cross the water in June, attend when suitable the nice art institute, buy the right books in the best bindings, saunter on Michigan Easter mornings in sun or wind. Oh, squalor, this sick four story hulk, this fibrous, this fiber fit with fissures everywhere. Why, what are bringings of loathe love largesse? What shall peril hunger so old, old? What shall flatter the desolate? Tin can, blocked fire escape, and chitterling, and swaggering seeking youth, and the puzzled wreckage of the middle passage, and urine, and stale shames, and again, the porridge of the underslung, and children, children, children. Heavens, that was a rat, surely, off there in the shadows. Long and long-tailed, gray. The ladies of the Betterment League agree it will be better to achieve the outer air that writes and steadies, to hie to a house that does not holler, to ring bells else time, better presently to cater to no more possibilities, to get away. Perhaps the money can be posted. Perhaps they too may choose another slum, some serious, sooty, half unhappy home where loathe love likely may be invested. Keeping their scented bodies in the center of the hall, as they walk down the hysterical hall, they allow their lovely skirts to graze no wall, are off at what, what they manage of a canter, and resuming all the clues of what they were, try to avoid inhaling the leaden air. I should say that this poem should probably be read alongside an earlier poem of Brooks from her book, Annie Allen, um, a poem called Beverly Hills, Chicago, which likewise narrates an outing, um, but in this case, um, the outing is made um, by black citizens from the South Side who are driving up through the white Northern neighborhood um, where even the garbage seems to gleam and they make kind of a wonderful pairing. That was a wonderful reading. Um, amazing to take us through that poem. We'll circle back to it as well. Ed, we'll turn to you uh, now with the poem that you've chosen from Chicago's past. 
Hello, everyone. Um, also, um, my thanks to be reading with folks, um, Chiku and Suzanne, who s s talked about our early times. Um, the poem that I, 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 I chose is um, Margaret Banner's poem. It's called The Elevator Man Adheres to Form. Um, Margaret Danner was the associate editor of um, Poetry Magazine when Poetry Magazine was actually housed in the Newberry Library in Chicago um, before years later um, when uh, the foundation was able to build its own uh, building. It was housed in the Newberry Library and the elevator man is the subject a Margaret Danner subject in this poem. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the uh, elevator uh, operators union uh, after I finish the poem. Um, the elevator operator adheres to form by Margaret Danner. I am reminded by the man who wings the elevator of Rococo art, his ways are undulating waves that shepherd and swing us Cupid-like from floor to floor. He sweethearts us with polished pleasantries, gallantly flourishing us up and up. No casual highs from him. His greetings, God's speedings, display his PhD aplomb and I should feel like a cherubim, be floor de lis and postel, shell like, but instead I vision other tan and deeper, much than tan, early Baroque like men who, seeing themselves still strutlessly groping, winding down subterranean grottos of injustice, down dark spirals, feel with such torturous stone smoke grade intensity that they exhale a hurricane of gargoyles that reel into it. I see these others boggling in their misery and wish this elevator artisan could fill with his flourishing form with war for them and turn his lettered zeal toward uplifting them above their crippling storm. Um, <laughs> this poem, um, I had written the, uh, arch the, the architecture poems um, to the, um, as, as Lisa pointed out, uh, I at one point wanted to be an architect and was always interested in architecture. So when I moved to Chicago, it was a big joy to be here in a textbook almost. And uh, I wrote the architecture poems and I showed them to Lisa when we talked about them. And uh, one of the poems I, I, I wrote was about uh, Otis Elevator, a very necessary invention in order for people to be able to go up these floors. Um, and this elevator operator uh, is a new, that's a new job. That's something that's solely invented by the technology. Um, so the status is invented by the technology. And these buildings actually in, invented the status for, the, for those service workers. Um, and of course, service was black folks. Um, and um, so they chose men who were educated. And that's even uh, brought out even more when the department stores had to choose uh, elevator operators. Uh, and the women were the major shoppers. The, the department stores knew that. The women were the major shoppers. And in many cases, the white women didn't shop. Their servants, black folks, uh, did the shopping. Well, black folks said maybe there should be some black women um, uh, elevator operators. 
and uh, it's a long story, but there are petitions and all kinds of goings on. And finally, the department stores began to hire ele elevator operators. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, and it shows up in Danner's poem, the interesting thing is that the department stores only chose light-skinned, non-Negroid demeanor. You see that? Non-Negroid demeanor, light-skinned Black women who had um, educations or normal school training or finishing school training. Those are the only Black women that they would uh, hire. Um, and it shows up in Danner's poem. I'm reminded by the tan man who wings the elevator of Rococo art. Rococo art is the decay of Baroque art. Baroque art is kind of tough. It's dark. It's kind of truthful. Rococo art is like we're doing today. It's sort of like <laughs> it doesn't see things. So all of that's in um, her poem. And it's just a description of this man, but she's got a history of Chicago and a history of Chicago employment and a history of Chicago unions. The black elevator operators were the beginnings of service unions. They're one of the early unions formed um, black elevator operators were then joined by jan janitors and then by um, um, building engineers. Uh, and eventually the black elevator operators sort of disappeared. Um, just uh, people would call it co-opted, but they disappeared in terms of numbers. Uh, through many conglomerations that became AFL-CIO. Black Elevators became AFL-CIO, which became the Teamsters, which became CEIU, downtown Chicago. Ed, that's extraordinary history. Can you remind us, I know Danner worked at Poetry Magazine, mid-century, yes. 1954 to 56 or so. When, when was this poem published? I thought I had it written down, but I can't remember. I have a question from Sally about the year of, of the poem. Pardon? It was finally it was finally published in 1970, written before then, but it was pu published in 1970. I see, I see. Yes, and you're right. I mean, Poetry Magazine was located on the fifth floor of the Newberry when Margaret editor was Margaret Danner was an associate editor there. I imagine she was probably the only other African American person she would have encountered at the library then was the elevator man, right? Mm -hmm. And so this poem is. The two of them. About, you know, about solidarity, but it's also a protest poem and it's also about art in such complicated ways. It's really amazing. I love it. Yeah, it's, yeah. It indicts me for one mm. thing. When you, when you gave me that poem, I sort of was back against the wall. Oh, no. I loved it. You know. <sighs> Well, it's a it's a poem that I, I I came upon when I was researching the women who were editors at the magazine, and I didn't know much about her, and I thought it was such an extraordinary poem, and I was um, uh, wishing that it had been republished. Um, and I and it's nice to have it through our event come out, go out into the world. Maybe people will uh, think about it a little bit more extensively. Margaret Danner, of course, was also a peer of Gwendolyn Brooks. They were in the same writing group together, um, uh, and then Danner went on. Um, uh, to Detroit. Um, she was very much a part of the Black arts movement like um, Brooks, but more Detroit-based after her time in Chicago. Um, and then Frank Marshall Davis kind of disappears, but he's the kind of father in some ways to a lot of these figures. In 1937, as Suzanne mentioned, he's part of the Southside Writers Group with Richard Wright. At that point, Davis is really the only published poet in the group. They're all really young, a lot of the poets who we know from that period now. Um, uh, Ed and, and Chiku and Suzanne, do you want to say anything more about the poems that you read in particular or, or comments too about Self-Portrait by Sel um, Frank Marshall Davis? Or I know it's a very long poem, Lovers of the Poor is just so, so extraordinary in its language and irony. Um, yeah, I, I want to ask Ed um, about um, elevators a little bit more. Um, 
you know, I love that. I mean, just the title of the poem, uh, The Elevator Man, adheres to form, you know, and this idea of, I mean, that's like a gorgeous formal image of like the entrance to the elevator, right? But mm -hmm. um, thinking about the elevator and as a kind of place for thinking about race in America or where that drama gets played out in particular ways. Um, you know, the poem makes me think about um, Col even Colson Whitehead's novel, The Intuitionist, and, um, you know, uh, the way that Whitehead imagines elevator inspectors <laughs> um, competing, uh, you know, unions of, or schools of elevator inspectors along racial lines in, in the novel. Um, so it seems like there's something kind of like really resonant about that space in American literary history. Um, but the thing that, you know, as a poet draws me most to the poem is, is the word form in the title um, and the, adhere, the idea of ad adherence to form um, in a poem who's, that rhymes form with storm, right, at the end. I think the last word is storm. Mm -hmm. um, and think of a storm as the most formless right, of things. And, and so, I don't know, what, what do you think about form in this poem or, or, or why the poem is addressing form or adhering to form? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... He's, uh, as, as I pointed out, the, there you had to be a certain kind of, or a certain form of black person in order to get the damn job, you know. Uh, so he was actually adhering to the form of what the institution, um, the building required. Um, the, the, the department stores hired women because the women did the shopping. The institutions um, hired men because the men were out there, you know, doing the big thing. Um, but they wanted certain kind of men. So you're exactly right. But when you look at what an elevator is, an elevator has to lift people. It's a road. An elevator is a road. Um, and on the road, black people have to get off the road don't have to get off the elevator because he's running the damn thing. Okay. So the elevator began to bring in certain things that the country had to look at, whether they knew that they were looking at it or not. They had to deal with those kinds of things. Now, to show you what happened, the Tulsa um, riot began when somebody reported a black elevator operator talking to a white woman elevator operator. They tried to convince her to say that she had been raped. She refused. But the city's burned down anyhow. So it's, it's a street. It's get out of my way. It's the, it's the American thing. The elevator concentrated that to a point that it blew up. Uh, we don't think about those things. Right. Um, the job of a black elevator operator was a respected thing in the community. My minister, when I grew up, I was nine years old, my minister from uh, Alabama uh, was um, a black elevator operator in the financial district of Pittsburgh. He was a very respected man. He was hard nails as hell. <laughs> and I imagine that that's exactly what went on in his elevators. And I imagine that's why he was so respected. But he wouldn't take anything from anybody. That's the way he preached um, as, 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 a, as a minister. But that was, a, that, was a, that was a hard job. People don't think about that. But that was a hard job. A new job introduced by the technology, and here you have black folks doing it. Absolutely, those are such good points. Suzanne, I'm curious what you think. We also have a comment from Bill Savage who says, elevators are interior transitional spaces where whites cannot avoid blacks, even if they want to do so. Yeah, yes. good point. Yeah, Suzanne, what, do you, what are your thoughts? 
um, uh, yeah. on this or the other poems either um, either I, you know they're 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 all amazing poems and um, you know to touch briefly on the Frank Marshall poem it's it's astonishing to me that that's the oldest poem um, in a way because it also sort of sounds the most contemporary um, you know it's it's lineation with this wild free verse where there's one word, one line that's just one word long, yeah. And then, you know, an incredibly long line, you know, and with bleach and with each bleach stub, I reserve the right to show, kill the bum at the empire. Um, and, you know, that it sounds so, that there's a tone that's so colloquial and conversational that does not sound to my ear like a poem from the forties. Uh, its form is so radically open, um, which maybe is part of the radical openness and candor um, that Chiku mentioned, where he actually discloses his own social security number, which seems like, as Chiku said, an incredibly radical, um, subversive gesture to perform. Um, you know, and the irony that you mentioned in the, um, the Brooks poem, I hear very loud and clear in this Marshall Frank Marshall Davis poem too, um, those lines, particularly the lines that are punctuated with exclamation marks. Um, Thank you, Mr. God and Mr. Roosevelt, or of course the line that sounds so incredibly um, dreadfully ironic today um, and surely did then too. Um, you know, I too can always call in a policeman. Um, you know, th there's something about the exclamation mark lines ring with uh, not a sarcasm, but an incredibly biting irony. Um, but the other line I really loved in that poem is the one I rate, yeah. yes. which has this wonderful double entendre. Of course, it's like this emphatic and insistence on his value as a citizen, but also it, you know, sounds like that word I rate, um, like being full of rage and anger that I can't imagine would be an accident in that poem so attentive to lineation. Can That's I, really I, great. Yeah, jump in, Ed. Um, both Suzanne and Chiku picked really, really important poems. Chiku's poem uh, points out um, what Suzanne says about that tone, that moment. Uh, if you look at that, if, if, if you look at that Davis poem, um, there's, there's that moment where he's no longer defined by his oppression. And he finally says, okay, come get me, motherfucker. <laughs> you yeah. know? And that's, that's that personal point of freedom that occurs to so many Black folks in this country where they just step out of the government, step out of whatever they're supposed to be, and they're free. Whether they're free or not, they're free. So he can give you his social security number, he can do anything, <laughs> you know, just fuck you. And he lives his life free as a free man. Suzanne points out you know, that, that those folks, it might've been for the, that point in the book's poem where um, she gives that list of what's too much for folks. Well, <laughs> In the Brooks poem, folks are living that. You know, okay, it's too much. I'm living. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's a point where you just free of what you're defined of. And both Suzanne and 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 Chiku pick poems that point to that moment. You know, come get me, motherfucker. Mm -hmm. I'm and and I'm there's something formally going on when that at that, that that breakage, whether it's um, Frank Marshall Davis's wild free verse, um, very conversational. And 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 Chica was asking about form. Notice how polite and ironic it is in 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 in, in Davis poem, and 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 how polite it is in Davis poem, and how ironic, slyly ironic it, it is in the Brooks poem. But you get the young kids today, today, and they'll cuss it like me. I'm using bad language on the on the air. Yeah, that's what I grew up with. You know, that's what it is. You know, so look at that voice of that freedom that's carried in the three poems that we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to I'd like to actually um, uh, jump to the present and to your own voices. Um, 
uh, make sure we have time for the, the work that you three are producing. Um, uh, and I think there are some really interesting through lines. So um, Ed, can we, we turn now to some of your recent work, the, the architecture poems, if you, as you call them, or as they're titled, Architectonus Poems. We're also gonna put on the screen some images that accompany the poems that Ed will read. Um, and then we'll have Suzanne and Chiku read too from their current work. So Ed, Ed let's, um, let's move into the present. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, the architect Tonis poems are 20 poems for the Chicago Architecture Center, is what I called them. And um, the second poem is about Otis, uh, the company that developed the architecture. So this poem is called Otis. Railroad architecture ran elevators off the ground to get weight it needed up, like people off the land to get over. Then an elevator railroad floated architecture up floors, open as planes to the sky, through walls into rooms coupled like cars to each other, without a climb halfway, distances like vistas through zigzag mountain valleys as works landscape. The first time since walking sheep in the cloud meadows far away from the later smoke the elevators laid more meadow out than the mountain had basis for. Its little square created anchorage, acreage out of air. More than the fiery iron horse, the hidden leg spider wove worlds more tightly into her realm of feeding upon more needed immediately. She trained her fare into catching her by waiting for her to swallow the fat ride she needed to keep her moving and moving faster with no feeling of movement. She has architecture anesthetized to no other way as long as there is up, it will feed her with it. She has learned how to go streetwise through airports even. She tells you when the moving walkway is ending. Oh. <laughs> The Otis uh, Corporation also um, invented uh, or perfected moving walkways. Up or down, it's a road. <laughs> the second poem is called uh, The Aqua. It's a um, um, uh, Chicago magazine, uh, the gang uh, corporation uh, or the architects. Only underneath the water from the street can you see up. The moss hanging floors of the waterfall cliff orchids of light off the ledge balconies. The re-vegetation of the canyon, the re-visualization of our spaces from our animal need to be curious about what's around our corners, not just that they square. The walls of wave canyons, beneath the Southwest, wash up here with clear views divest of the ground to dust of much that has lifted to where they can see is runoff, a drainage of Romanoff richness in its dissolution of geography. The Appalachian humps, bodies bedded the longhouse state to horizon. The Smokies rouse from the valleys by the updrafts bump. You look up into a landscape from a bird up turn view. <laughs> I think if you've seen the Smokies, you, you, you see that inside of the, the uh, building. The marina. Uh, th this building, um, Chicagoans call um, call this building the the corn cob. But 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 there was a time, there was a point in in city uh, organization when they knew that in order to get workers into the city, they had to give them 
houses, they had to give them parking spaces, and they had to cut down their travel time. And the marina was one of the first buildings to those nice balconies you see there are the living spaces. Below those balconies are the parking spaces, and below the parking spaces are the restaurants, the cleaners. <laughs> It's one of the first buildings to be, you don't have to leave it. Pie in the sky with petal pinch crust stacked high above its park of delivering vehicles on the river. A pie boat too can cut in. There's a marina home to pine cone peel down balcony. Symmetry fun for the tie up and sing dock of the day as it this city doesn't hold back bay manners up, nor not talk straight. It does look like a corn cob. <laughs> mm. A celestial gate from here, it's called a bean. It's called a cloud gate, but it's called a bean. Cakes of ice with faces on them, it's a fountain. The base, the column of river, wheels, roof, over your head with food and amenities layered in between your work all day and immediate need to sit down without traffic stacked up on one convenient location. Residents willing to pay for required freedom of imagination, insight into freedom, the capital, let's say, to try anything once, but more deeply, freedom from, from fear of response. Um, the, the, the workers who took those apartments didn't have to travel on the freeway. Um, they didn't have to walk in, in the streets that they thought were dangerous. They just went downstairs. Um, that might have been convenient, but think about what it does to the society. The um, sculpture downtown is called, uh, we call it the bean. Uh, the sculptor calls it Cloud Gate. Um, it's a huge um, drop of water. It's just a drop. Um, but when you get inside it, you look up and you can see the sky. Ed, this is extraordinary. And I encourage everybody to take a look at all the 20 poems as part of the series and more of Ed's work. It should be noted too that the poems themselves are very, I mean, this is simplif simplifying things, but they're architectural, they're um, sonnets or rooms, right? The poems themselves are rooms, uh, but then the, the words themselves are spaced out in really extraordinary ways to make you very aware of the space that the words are taking, the rooms that they're inhabiting. Um, really amazing series. Um, I want to make sure we have time too for Suzanne and Chiku. So Suzanne, if we can turn to you next from, uh, from some of your recent work, if you will read. Uh, sure. I would just like to say I love those poems, Ed, and they are a much better guide to Chicago's architecture and history than those riverboat tours that <laughs> <laughs> our tourists tend to frequent, myself included. Um, I'm going to read from my most recent book, which is called The Pillow Book. Um, and it's ostensibly about the kind of insomnia that accompanies new motherhood, but it's also very much about what it feels like to live um, as a privileged person on the south side of Chicago and the kind of moral whiplash that accompanies this position. Um, in this case, um, my experience is filtered through the reading of another a historical woman of privilege, Say Shonigan, who was a lady in waiting to the Empress in the High End Court in Japan and whose original pillow book provided me with a form. I'm calling it poetry, but you, as you'll hear, it is um, largely prose with several dozen lists sprinkled in. I'm just gonna read three paragraphs and a list um, that are kind of plucked from various parts of the menu, uh, from the book. The contours of my world, when I compare it to the ancient watercolor map I find on Wikipedia, would fit very easily within the gates of High and Keel. I live in a tiny pocket of good luck within a blighted urban zone on the south side of Chicago in a townhouse, a short walk to the university 
the grocery store, the preschool, the bank, the emergency room, and the once and future home of the 44th president of the United States of America. Over the past 200 years, I have learned since we moved here from the north side, this neighborhood has seen many changes. Some even seem promising. Will the ice cream parlor last? The yoga studio? The cinema? The Chipotle going up in the empty parking lot behind the liquor store is a good sign. Still, all day at my desk and on my pillow at night, I hear looping sirens tightening a frail perimeter. I cannot hear the lake a half mile to the east, but standing at my window some nights, I smell its icy exhalations through the trees. Though my husband insists it's just the soundtrack to the zombie apocalypse he has cajoled me into watching with him, I maintain that the shrieking in the background is coming, in fact, from outside. I crack the sliding back door to confirm. Don't you know this is real, woman? A man bellows beyond the fence. You a fool, a woman's voice rages back, her shadow raising its hands against the neighbor's garage. Put that damn thing down. Call 911, I whisper, frozen stiff on the threshold. But they are on their way already. Within seconds, an unmarked police cruiser glides soundlessly down the dark street, rounds the corner towards the fading cries in the alley, and dissolves into the night like a dream. In the meantime, the motley crew of survivors on screen, we discover, when we sink back into our pillows with our tepid cups of hot cocoa, have staggered into the temporary safety of a large abandoned prison farm. Within a 10 minute walk from my pillow is Jackson Park, site of the 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition and host in its glory to over 1500 visitors a day. Today it hides in plain sight like a bright slice of enlightenment, host to a striking variety of migrating songbirds, wintering water birds, endless waves of incontinent geese, and a small night heron who hugs the muddy shore of the Osaka Garden Pond, which was destroyed by patriotic vandals during World War II and restored reluctantly 50 years later with municipal funds. I like to walk there when the sun is out. Today I brought pillows and sat in the gazebo with Her Majesty, sipping Celestial Seasonings Sleepy Time Peach Tea. And I'll just end with a short list um, from one of several in the book. This one is called Sounds I Don't Expect to Hear. Solar wind. A rose opening. Silence on the 4th of July. The mating cry of the King Island emu. Hecklers at the ballet. Foghorns in the mare cognitum. Melting cheese. A rich man entering heaven. A poor man entering the Senate, mermaids singing, pure math. Suzanne, thank you. And I just wanna um, say that her book is extraordinary in its lists, poems as lists, and also for its humor. There's so much humor in a pillow book. So I recommend it to uh, to all of the people gathered here via Zoom tonight. It's a very, very funny book. Dark, fu darkly funny, but very, very funny. All right, Chiku, we do have a few minutes left for you. So we're gonna turn it over to you now. Great, well, I, I mean, this has been so great. Thank you, Ed, those poems are amazing. And Suzanne, thanks for reading a poem that has me in it. I guess I should say in interest of full disclosure, Suzanne and I are uh, our spouses and 
broadcasting from different rooms in the same house right now. Um, but because we only have a few minutes left, I thought I would read a poem as a, I'm, I'm, I think I'm the only Chicagoan here. I was born in the greater Chicagoland area in Maywood. Um, and uh, so, I'll, but I grew up in the suburbs. So whenever I would tell people I was from Chicago, uh, downtowners, they would say, oh yeah, you're from the suburbs. So I'll read a poem about, um, that goes back to that part of the, my greater Chicagoland childhood um, from this new book, Underworld Lit. Some of my happiest childhood memories end in a painful death. Every Saturday after soccer, the Taiwanese twins next door would come over with their monster manual and a drawstring, drawstring bag full of odd dice. And we'd descend the steps to face skeletons in cages, poison rivers, monsters on thrones, and a bloody minotaur who butchered me on more than one scrambled for the secret exit. Otherwise, my early years were uneventful. I dripped ink onto paper. I rode my bicycle to music land. Now I find myself steadying a wobbly deck chair under my wife as she tapes a raptor silhouette to our sliding glass door. We're making home improvements to our sunlit underworld. Soon we'll leave for the march downtown. Supervising our work from her inflatable pool, Mira flashes us a thumbs up. There's a feathery thud against the window next door. Thanks. Thanks, Chiku. Um, again, that's from Underworld Lit, just out. Looks like this. Um, I love the resonances of all of these poems together. And I will say um, part of my subversive aim in bringing you all together, of course, is to think about the heterogeneity of Chicago poetry um, from people who were born and raised here, from people who passed through here, and the influences of what is, um, what's happening here um, upon poets everywhere, right? Chicago poetry is, is never one, one thing. It's, it's so many things. Um, and we're, we're so lucky to have the three of you um, riding out of this city right now. So I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. I know there's <clears throat> much more to discuss and think about, but I think we've left you with some extraordinary poems. Um, I want to let you all know that um, this video is being recorded and it will be available on the Newberry's YouTube channel in a few days. Um, and then just lastly, a note about all of our programs and some of our future programs. They will always be free and open to the public and um, they're supported through the generosity of our donors. So during this really critical time, we need the support of our entire community. So think about making a gift to the Newberry today. Just go to our website and you can do it. We look forward to welcoming visitors back to events at the Newberry soon, as soon as it's safe to do so. In the meantime, please join us for our next virtual event. It'll be on October 13th, and it will be with Jill Wine Banks and Peter Slevin in the latest installment of our Conversations at the Newberry. And the title of their conversation, it's really relevant, just a few weeks before the election. It's called Presidential Scandal in the Media from Nixon to Trump. So you can register for this and all the other programs on our website, newberry, uh, newberry.org. Thanks again to the Angel Family Foundation and to our three poets, Shiku Reddy, Suzanne Buffum, and Ed Roberson for joining us. And thanks to everyone tonight. Be well.